who thinks we should be spending four and a half billion pounds on something that, okay, let's have a look. Um, this is what it looks like inside. Um, this is just a portion of it. Obviously, it's a 14 mile long circle underground tunnel. They, they shoot these particles. In this case, I'm going to show you the image. They shoot a cesium particle into a palladium atom. And what they do is they try to create a, a, a nuclear detonation. Now, when the detonation fails, we get to photograph it. And this is this is what it looks like. Or so they tell us. We have to take it face val a value that they're speaking the truth. Now, the title of my talk is Chaos versus the Goldilocks Zone. Does anybody know what the Goldilocks Zone is? The next morning, they got all the talk. The Goldilocks Zone is an unpopular word amongst physicists and scientists today. And it addresses a whole series of very narrow windows of potentiality wherein elements fluctuate. Now I'm talking about Goldilocks zones in terms of the charge of an atom. It's balanced just right, not too cold, not too hot, not too big, not too small. Remember the story of Goldilocks? Now Goldilocks zones also present in the structure of the, of the atmosphere of the Earth. We have a stratosphere, we have a, an ionosphere, we have an atmosphere, and every single one of those spheres has a very small window in which it fluctuates, and out of which it does not go. The viscosity of water. If we study the structure of water, there are very strict parameters outside of which water does not work. Right? Also, there are Goldilocks zones in the behavior of cells. Every cell is dependent on certain elements, and those elements have to be present in the exact degree in order for the cell to function and to metabolize. Take out that element or push its charge one degree up or down, and what happens? The whole thing starts to collapse. They've noticed this in stellar structures. They've noticed it in galaxial structures. When you look at our galaxy, it lands on a plane. It's called the galaxial plane. Why is that? That's a Goldilocks zone. So chaos is now being used by scientists to describe causality, the origin of species. When you look at Darwinism, they talk about mistakes. They talk about genetic errors. They talk about chaos. They talk about random. They talk about chance as being causative. But who was it? Hobbes, the famous Enlightenment philosopher from Scotland, said chance is another. Chance is synonymous with our ignorance. Now. This is an image of a palladium atom during, uh, during a collision that didn't succeed. Now, when they have fission, they have a nuclear detonation, and they cannot photograph that. We talked about this last week. Those of you who are here, you may remember. Now, in these photographs, we're witnessing, you see these, actually, I can't notice this. Can you hold that for me? <laughs> you see these shells? Does anybody know what these are called? They represent the shells of an atom. Now we know in quantum mechanics we have this problem called hyperpositioning. Does anybody know what that is? It's a dread subject to classical and Newtonian Einsteinian physicists. Einstein hated this subject. In fact, you know the story, I think I told you the joke last week. Why did Einstein cross the street? To get away from Niels Bohr. But on the other side of the street, Niels Bohr was there also. Now, that's funny to those of us who understand that Niels Bohr had the philosophy that we should accept hyperpositioning or superpositioning or non-locality. That when you look at it for a particle, you're going to find a particle. If you look for a wave, you're going to find a wave. But the problem is that particle looks to be in two places at once. Why? Because it's working so fast and it's moving so at such a speed that the electron itself is creating a wave pattern that encases the center of the atom. We call that the nucleus, or we call it these Einstein Bose condensates. Now, that is not chaotic, is it? Do you see any chaos here? There are fluctuations of chaos on the perimeter of this shell, and when you get when you when you magnify this, you see all kinds of what looks like artwork. And the more you magnify it, you see weird things that they don't want 
really to talk about. Weird things, like these stars presenting here and there. Now again, you have the cesium particle, which represents the bullet that they try to get to go at the speed of light. They try to reach 186,000 miles a second, and they bombard this, part, this palladium atom with this bullet. And it's ricocheting along the inside of the chamber of the structure of the atom. Now watch, this is the detritus, or the broken bits, that come out of the atom interior. These, these, are, these have various names, but we won't go into that. But what happens when they start spinning off? You see how they follow, they go like a drain pipe effect? That's not chaos either, is it? This is showing a gravitational field, a new gravitational field that wasn't there. We talked about that two weeks ago. Now, why do I bring that up? Because this is not chaos. This is a new gravitational parameter that is forcing those subatomic particles to disappear. But before they do so, they follow a drain pipe effect. That's not chaos. Why? Because gravity is creating a change in that particle's activity, or its characteristics, or its behavior. Gravity is forcing it, as a law, to behave in a new way. No chaos, ladies and gentlemen. Why am I pushing on this? Because these scientists get away decade after decade, year after year, by using chaos to model the origins of the universe. And they get away with it. But the problem is, when we examine fractals, fractals, does anybody want to explain what a fractal is? Fraction of an atom. Sorry? Is it a fraction of an atom? No, a fraction of an atom, oh, well, it's, there's a relationship there, but does anybody know what a fractal is? A model is in a model, yes. It's a kind of hologram, isn't it? But it's based on chaos. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to sound rough and crude, but this is a lie, and I'll explain why. The very first fractal, which was founded by a, a chap named Benoit Mandelbrot, this is an example of a fractal. Here's another fractal. This is the Mandelbrot set. This is the very first fractal ever designed. Does anybody know where it comes from? An atom? Close. It comes from three chaos modeling uh, systems. This chap was such a genius. I think I mentioned to you last week, two weeks ago. He was such a genius, he would go from biochemistry to neurophysics to t uh, uh, telephone technologies and see where the chain of thinking was weak. And he would come up with an advent, uh, a design, uh, a, a patent that no one had ever thought about. And then he would move on to another discipline as though he didn't care. And this made people very angry because they wish they'd thought it up, you know? And one time he was working at the world's largest computer, civilian computer installation in upstate New York, a mile and a half away from where I used to ski in Tibetan. We used to tr trespass on their land. And in that... Um, headquarters, IBM headquarters, they have a, a GT6600 mainframe computer, the biggest computer in the world. And he was working there to get the phone bugs out of the first computer, uh, internet system in 1982. And his job was to correct the optic fiber um, um, uh, tr transportation of information into and out of the system. So what he did was he asked, oh, it's, it's holiday time. Everyone's going away for Christmas. Uh, maybe I can <coughs> borrow this computer for a week, uh, a week or so. So he had to hire all these lawyers. And he took all the, all the software off and all the data. And then he fed in 2,000 years of Nile change uh, in the coastal. When the Nile falls into the med, they have observed for the last two millennia how many different ways the delta changes. They consider, he considered that chaotic. So he turned that into a binary language, bless you, and then fed it into the system. Then he took 100 years of meteorological slash weather changes over Boston. Then he turned that into the same binary language, fed that into the system. And then he took 100 years of cotton trade vicissitudes in North America. Chaos, theoretically, fed that into the system. And then he created a color resignation filter that allowed colors to separate from the spectrum along what he called strange attractors. So you get this kind of three-dimensional image. Now guess what? When he wrote his books, and when other people wrote about him, 